back to the Baxter Standing Committee for the Care and Use of Animals and Research um, workshop on the Guide for the Care and Use of Laboratory Animals. Uh, this morning, we're going to start session four, uh, which is on key topics in housing and husbandry. And starting us off will be Dr. Susan Harper from the Standing Committee. And moderator for this session will be Dr. Jim Fox from the Standing Committee. So with that, I'd um, like to welcome everybody. And Susan, you can take it away. Uh, thank you for that. It's my pleasure to introduce session four, which focuses on some of the key topics relevant to the housing and husbandry of animals. During our listening sessions, this proved to be a complex topic that provided extensive feedback, and I'm, I'm excited to hear from our four very distinguished panelists who are going to address some of the specific areas that motivated the most interest and comments. Issues related to animal... Uh, next slide, please. Issues related to animal care, environment, and housing, as found in Chapter 3 of the current guide, stimulated a lot of discussion in all of the listening sessions. Every group seemed to have opinions on this topic. However, as you'd expect, the sessions that involve the Veterinary Professional Society seem to generate the most discussion, and that's probably because these are the individuals who represent the front line in terms of coming up with solutions to address unique preferences and requirements for the growing list of species that are encountered in science. The top three areas that received the most attention emphasized general housing and management practices, the welfare and well-being of animals, and social housing. As we heard in several of the sessions yesterday, most participants understood the value of more precisely defined engineering standards, but there's a growing interest to allow programs to have some flexibility to develop performance-based animal housing and care options, which are best aligned with their own institution's research needs. It was frequently noted that broad requirements for social housing are not practical and in some cases not in line with the welfare of certain species or individual animals that are not highly social. Many felt that local authorities are in the best position to determine the best uh, or most and preferred housing arrangements for these animals. Many participants also commented that engineering standards are often arbitrary due to the lack of supporting scientific data and therefore can be difficult to consistently maintain in facilities that are aging and obsolete. Managing around these rigid parameters is a challenge that often contributes to regulatory burden, and in many cases may not result in a significant welfare advantage or a higher level of animal care. Instead, there needs to be better recognition and appreciation for the diversity of species, programs, and research goals that are best served when iCooks are afforded some level of autonomy to develop a flexible approach that aligns most appropriately with their program's unique needs. However, there was also consensus that many iCook members and program staff are not adequately trained or confident to take on these responsibilities. And there should be an increased emphasis on educational programs aimed at developing those skills to address these limitations. Next slide. Because many environmental parameters are based on engineering standards that were founded on convention rather than science, some have become irrelevant or outdated with evolving technology. These standards often conflict with green management principles that are intended to promote sustainability and minimize waste. This was a leading reason that many participants felt it was time to take another look, a more critical look at these parameters used to regulate facility ventilation rates, humidity levels, temperature, and other environmental conditions. Some participants viewed this as a priority and felt that standards should ideally be tailored to address the needs of a particular species or strain or specific life stage, and flexibility should be allowed to address an animal's social preferences either on an individual basis or as a group. There was agreement that facility environments have been influenced by advances in caging, equipment, and other husbandry practices, most of which have developed since the last guide was issued, and there should be pathways to validate and adopt these technologies, equipment, and practices as our knowledge base expands, with opportunities for the affected groups to offer feedback on the value of these refinements prior to their broad implementation. It was also widely understood that programs are coming under pressure to comply with new environmental mandates and how this makes it more difficult to maintain the status quo by operating 
uh, by continuing to operate within rigidly defined standards. We heard that a comprehensive forward thinking approach is needed to address these challenges. However, although there was broad recognition that changes are needed and likely overdue, we were reminded many times of the need to exercise caution before making any major changes to the current standards. Decisions to incorporate new equipment and practices must be based on solid scientific evidence that confirms a discernible positive impact on the health and welfare of animals and implemented in a phased, deliberate, and thoughtful manner to assure a smooth and efficient transition, particularly when significant time, funding, and resources are involved. Next slide. Finally, listening session participants endorsed several ideas that may be beneficial to include in the next guide, either by expanding the content of the guide itself or directing users to supplemental references. We found there was strong interest in having more information on the natural behaviors and enrichment preferences of various species that are commonly encountered in research. We also learned there was support to expand aquatic housing recommendations to accommodate the ever-increasing number and diversity of species that are being used as animal models. Many participants advocated for including low-stress handling and non-aversive techniques that improve animal welfare without interfering with scientific objectives. We also heard support for modifying recommendations on sanitizing and cleaning equipment that will allow more flexibility in terms of the methods and frequency, and as new caging and substrates become more popular. There, was strong, there were strong interests in having access to reliable information on the husbandry, care, and handling of novel species and sensitive animal populations that are becoming more common as animal models. Although participants debated whether the guide should be expanded to include this information or direct, or it should, it, whether it should direct users to external references developed by vetted subject matter experts. And there is also growing support to have more guidance available either in the guide or through alternate sources on how to safely transport animals. And so with that, it's now time to hear from our first speaker, uh, Dr. Brianna Gaskill, and I'll let her introduce herself. So it still says that my um, ability to share is disabled. Oh, there we go. Great. All right. Hopefully you can see my screen. Can somebody verbally let me know that that's, that's true? We can see your yes. screen. Thank you. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, thank you everyone for the opportunity to um, talk to you about this topic that is near and dear to my heart. Um, and I kind of want to set the stage as well that um, this is my, in my opinion, this is a huge topic that cannot be adequately addressed in 18 minutes. So I'll address uh, a couple uh, low hanging fruit in my opinion in this webinar and provide some background information and citations on others for the committee to consider um, outside of this webinar. So as with many of the other speakers, the views expressed in this presentation are mine and mine alone and do not necessarily reflect the views of my current employer. So I'm gonna start with my take home message here. And, and I really want the committee to really think about and understand that stress is inherent to life whether in the wild or perhaps in the laboratory. So in essence, stress can never be completely eliminated. However, there are aspects of a rodent, specifically thinking about mice and rats here, um, that are tailored to human needs and not necessarily the needs of mice and rats, uh, which can cause stress. Actually, the ACD Working Group on Enhancing the Rigor, Transparency, Translatability's final report from 2021 describes some of these factors. And in one particular study where a lab reviewed years of data on thermal nociception, environmental factors accounted for as much as 42% of the data variability. And in fact, the people running the experiment explain more variability than the animal's genetics. So if we know what some of these factors are, we know that they cause stress. Is it possible that we can tweak some of these factors to further reduce stressful stimuli in the animal's environments? 
or even better, provide the animals with the ability to exercise control over those stressors. Um, and this is ultimately going to be beneficial for welfare. So in essence, I'm hoping the take home message is that poor welfare means poor science. So what do rodents actually want and need when it comes to these environmental factors? Well, historically we've made our best guesses and some urgent legends say that some of it was a lot of trial and error. Uh, but the field of animal welfare science, which got its start in the 1950s in the United Kingdom, uh, have been developing ways of asking various species these exact questions. And if anyone didn't notice, um, actually in the last day or so, there was a New York Times article on um, the animal welfare judging competition that happens in universities uh, in North America. It's a, it's a pretty good read and really illustrates how complex of a question evaluating an animal's welfare is. But the field has developed simple preference tests to much more complex tasks on economic theory, based on economic theories and human psychology. Now these tests can be utilized to understand from an animal's point of view what they want. Regardless of these tools, there's still a lot we don't know about what is best for supporting normal biological rhythms or what is preferred, preferred by these rodents because it's difficult to fund rodent husbandry research programs. So in some cases, we do know what they want and what they need, but it often conflicts with human or regulatory needs. There's a couple examples here, uh, feeding uh, rodents on the floor. Um, as we heard from Dr. Pritchett Corning yesterday, uh, in some of the earlier versions of the guide, they were really um, encouraging the, the not feeding on the floor and, and hanging different feeders. Um, but rodents, uh, what do rodents do to actually indicate that a food source is safe? Well, they defecate and urinate on it and around it. Um, and of course, we as humans find this very distasteful and want clean food. Uh, there's other examples such as temperature, uh, and I'll go into this a little bit more in depth uh, in a little bit, but all of the guide recommended temperatures induce cold stress and likely affect a lot of the biological outcomes that we measure uh, and use, use them for in scientific purposes. However, the temperatures that mice would feel comfortable would probably heat stress the people that are working in it, working within those environments. So now we have this disparity between the people who are working in those environments and the animals who live in them. So some of these answers are not always really straightforward and some scientists are actually still quite naive to the impact it has on their research. So here's a list of factors I want to, to cover today. This is by no means a comprehensive list, but are some of the top factors that I could try to cover in 18 minutes. And in fact, I'm probably only gonna get through about half of them. Um, and so these are some things that I think the, the committee should closely evaluate uh, to improve animal welfare, as well as the science we use them, the animals for. Now, within these factors, I'm going to discuss why the guide should care, focusing on new information. But in some cases, I'm actually planning on highlighting air, uh, information where we've known this factor affects physiology and welfare, but have previously ignored it or the solution was complicated and difficult to find um, a resolution. So we'll start off with light. This is something that's been top of mind for me for the last few years, specifically when it comes to rodents. Um, and so what does the guide say? Well, as I went back through and reread it, um, there's no actual threshold recommendations except for animals susceptible to retinopathy, uh, which is that last bullet point, 130 to 325 lux. Um, it talks about 325 lux in the middle of the room, a meter off the floor, but it actually doesn't have a should statement to it, which I found quite interesting because I was always defaulted to that less than 325 lux. So why is this important? Well, light can affect physiology, morphology, and the behavior of various animals. It's important for circadian biology, uh, which affects many aspects of physiology. As a field, we are quite good at understanding the importance of photo period, but often photo intensity and spectral quality of the light of the animal's current or prior exposure are not really considered and neither frequently monitored or even measured correctly. Uh, so what's new and should be considered uh, by the committee? Well, actually, um, very timely, uh, myself, as well as a lot of other uh, collaborators just published a manuscript earlier this year recommending species-specific measurement of vivarium lighting. 
Uh, we currently measure light in lux, which is based off the perception of light by the human eye. And rodents have very different eyes than we do. They see ultraviolet light, which is not provided. And in my opinion, perhaps violates the should of providing adequate light for vision um, in, in the guide. Uh, and in fact, many aspects of urine markings by ro rodents fluoresce in the UV, uh, but they don't necessarily have the light appropriate to detect it. So uh, this paper recommended uh, violet pumped LED lights to provide UV cone stimulation without the negative effects of actual UV exposure. The paper goes on to discourage complete darkness because for rodents, this is not normal and sets various thresholds for light exposure at night and a minimum needed during the day to, proper, to ensure proper circadian entrainment. As there is almost no literature on lighting preference uh, for rodents, uh, the group recommended that basically the opportunity to hide from light to be very important. Um, even if, um, and this is where this goes back to this comment I made about providing animals with the control over various stressors. If an animal has a, a darker environment that they can escape to, even though that may not necessarily be the lighting condition that they would prefer, they still feel as if they have control over that aversive stressor. Um, and ultimately is likely to have less of an impact physiologically from that chronic stress. Uh, the paper also goes on to describe that some red light may actually still be detected by photosensitive retinal ganglion cells in the eye. And so recommended recommendations for intensity and frequency of red lighting is provided. Moving on to the next topic, temperature. I probably could take an entire um, day to go over this topic. Um, for those of you who know me, this is uh, kind of my uh, area of or my soapbox, I, I could definitely get on. Um, so in the guide, we often focus on this 20 to 26 degrees Celsius for laboratory rodents. And, and why is this important? I think it's pretty straightforward. Most of us understand why temperature is important for behavior and welfare. Um, because maintaining homeothermy is essential for survival for mammals. Maintaining a constant core temperature is energetically costly if an animal is housed below its lower critical temperature. Now in the, la in the laboratory, all housing temperature recommendations are below this lower critical temperature. Now, if below the lower critical temperature, metabolism must increase to generate heat to counter out, counteract this heat loss to maintain homeothermy. Now in mice, typical lab temperatures of around 20 degrees Celsius can lead to a 50 to 60% increase in metabolic rate above basal levels. And I don't think that this is necessarily in accordance with that second bullet summary from the guide um, that says that there should be minimal stress um, and physiological alteration. To me, 50% um, 50 to 60% increase is quite substantial. And if we put this in human terms, what is considered a mild cold stress for humans is about a seven to 11% increase in, in metabolic rate. So um, there's a wealth of data indicating that at these typical laboratory temperatures, mice have altered immune functions, reproduction, bone mineral density, fever responses, et cetera. So I think there's a substantial amount of data to indicate that this is a substantial stressor on these animals. So what's new or what should be considered? Well, I feel as if there's been a lot of work that has been ignored on this subject. We've known for a very long time that these temperatures cause cold stress. And in fact, in the last version of the guide update, um, we saw that the, the basal levels for temperature going from um, being increased from 18 degrees Celsius to 20 degrees Celsius. And I'm still constantly shocked that when I talk to scientists, that they have no idea that mice in their laboratories are cold stress. This scenario is one of the examples where we have this human, human need and animals uh, being at odds with one another. I'm sure most animal technicians would revolt if we asked them to do manual labor in 30 degrees Celsius or 86 degrees Fahrenheit. On top of this, you can't even choose a perfect temperature for even a single mouse as this changes with age as well as throughout the day based on the animal's behaviors. And I don't think, I do think, however, there is a simple solution to this challenge um, where I think the answer should be uh, per perhaps considering the increase of those basal lower temperature range levels for uh, rodents, as well as providing rodents with adequate nesting material. While the provision of nesting has increased substantially since the last version of the guide, 
I would challenge the committee to, to determine if rodents, mice in particular, are provided with adequate resources for behavioral thermal regulation. A lot of my previous work has indicated that eight to 10 grams is needed to eliminate thermal stress when housed at 26 degrees Celsius. However, eight grams can reduce thermal stress at 20 degrees Celsius, but it does not eliminate it, especially in females. Now, in addition, this work has been done with groups of three mice, and if mice are housed singly or in pairs, more material is likely necessary. And I would ask the committee to consider bringing up baseline recommended temperatures, as well as requiring a minimum nesting for small rodents in reproductive cages, and perhaps some caveats for increased material and temperature for females, uh, uh, nude animals, and singly housed animals. Moving on to enrichment. So what does the guide say here? Um, there are several comments indicating that this topic uh, merits further study, included, including exercise as well as human contact, um, that animals should, uh, enrichment should provide animals with the degree of control over stressors as I continue to, to nod back to. And for ethical reasons, um, there's a, a benefit of providing enrichment for animals to provide them with a good life, as well as um, some recent data to indicate that non-enriched environments may be affecting rodent health, especially in stress-sensitive diseases. There's a lot of recent evidence, specifically by the Cal Lab at The Ohio State, on the effects of enriched environments on the aging, immunity, cancer, and, and cancer. And there's also a meta-analysis by uh, Kate from the Mason Lab at the University of Guelph indicating that animals in enriched environments are better able to deal with disease states. Um, indicating that enrichment isn't just a nice thing to do, but is important for the validity of our science. So for mice, there is sufficient evidence to indicate that nesting is probably beyond a, an enrichment and perhaps a necessity for mice um, and for ro reproductive rodents. On top of this, uh, shelters where all animals can fit within should be required for rats uh, to meet behavioral needs. I would also like the committee to consider the need for an enrichment coordinator at facilities to help provide uh, species specific recommendations um, with strong evidence to indicate why some of these enrichments might be uh, necessary for behavior, for welfare, as well as for appropriate physiological functioning. And to understand that conventional housing um, how this has an effect on their, on their environment, on their physiology. Uh, so this probably also would help us better, more closely achieve refinement as defined by Russell and Birch and the three R's, um, and provide more positive experiences for animals and not necessarily simply the elimination of negative ones. Moving on to handling and physical restraint. Um, so what does the guide say here? Well, really the focus in the guide is primarily on physical restraint and not necessarily on basic handling procedures or techniques. It discusses um, positive reinforcement training, but only specifically calls out larger species, but does say it could be generally useful for any species. Uh, this mentions that prolonged restraint should be avoided. What exactly is prolonged restraint? Um, having some indications on what that might be, I think would be very helpful because this could be a very subjective uh, interpretation. However, in the preface, the authors actually describe the following topic as an area for further investigation um, and specifically calling out human contact as one of those areas. So why is this important? Well, I think the impact of basic handling stress is undervalued and ignored. Um, I love the story about Hans Selye, the father of stress physiology, and how he discovered the HPA access because he did a horrible job restraining and handling his rats. So really, stress has the potential to affect most aspects of physiology, induces fear and anxiety, which is not, in my opinion, in line with the intent of the three R's. So what's new or should be considered in this particular area? Well, I believe there are some topics within restraint that should be considered based on our understanding of how stressful this can be and how easily it can be avoided if animals are trained. But how do we know if they are trained and what do we do or what does it look like if those animals don't necessarily meet the training criteria? Well, positive reinforcement training shows amazing results in terms of welfare and has the potential to improve data variability. 
while not much is published on positive reinforcement training in rodents, um, but the work being done by the RISE Institute in Sweden really illustrates how differently our animals behave when trained and habituated to human-animal interactions. And this implication for welfare benefits on a daily basis are actually quite astounding. While restraint Dr. only accounts for... Yes. You have about a minute and a half. I just wanted to let you know. Yep, that's great. Uh, so while restraint only accounts for a portion of human-animal interactions in the lab, basic handling changes have the potential for rodent welfare. And the obvious area of research to be considered in this category has to do with refined handling, so tunnel or cupping, and the opportunities to provide positive handling experiences with rats for via tickling or playful handling. There's a wealth of literature that has been accumulated by the 3RC as well as the NC3Rs to provide a weight of evidence that refined handling in mice affects welfare and scientific outcomes. Similarly, a strong body of evidence from neuroscience supports the benefits of interacting with rats in species specific and positive ways. So how can the guide encourage movement away from negative experiences to support neutral or even positive ones, as was the intent by Russell and Birch by instilling the framework of the three R's. So I would like the committee to consider the importance of simple handling has on welfare and the study outcomes and encourage the use of the methods mentioned. Lastly, exploring the importance of habituation acclimation for rodent study when, ha when handling is involved. So while I have tons of other topics to talk about, such as noise and vibration, so social needs, the impacts of bedding material, ultimately that's all I have time for today. And really hopefully I can get across the fact that stress is inherent, um, but there are ways that we can potentially tweak these, providing animals with control of these stressors to reduce the physiological impact. And that really poor, that good welfare does indeed mean good science. And with that, I am finished. So now we'll hear from Dr. Bloomsmith. Do you have my slides to begin? Thank you. I'm Molly Bloomsmith from the Emory National Primate Research Center, and I'm real happy to be here today to talk to you about refinements in non-human primate housing and husbandry. Next slide, please. What I will do today is review progress in these six areas since the guide was last issued. And there's been a huge amount of scientific work done in this area. And as much as possible, I'm going to rely on that science to make some recommendations or suggestions for what should be considered as the guide is revised. And in a few cases, I'll rely on popular practice. Next. So social housing in non-human primates, there's always been a large body of literature and this has been added to in recent years. There's a consistent finding that compatible social housing improves behavior, uh, reduces stress that animals experience, can in, improve their clinical health. Single housing and nursery rearing on the other hand are major risk factors for the development of behavioral problems in non-human primates. And single housing has even been labeled as a psychosocial stressor. So our consensus is still that social housing is the foundation to support non-human primate welfare. And the vast majority of non-human primates in US research facilities are socially housed. They're being socially housed in quarantine when they have experimental appliances within some infectious disease research studies and even when controlled diets are a requirement for studies. I also wanna point out that there are some experimental interventive studies being done with non-human primates who are group housed. And I've listed a few examples here. Next. So social living might be very important to the quality of biomedical science that's going on with non-human primates. It can improve the repeatability, uh, the reproducibility, and its external validity. 
Here I'm showing a couple of examples of um, these types of findings within SIV research. And these investigators believe that social housing enhances the translation of their work to humans who are, after all, socially housed, um, and that this can improve the quality of their science by reducing variability, probably through reducing stress that the animals experience. Next. So these are my uh, points for consideration in the next version of the guide encouraging intermittent social housing or any type of social housing when full contact's not possible, group housing research subjects rather than pairing them when that is possible. And I think there needs to be more attention given to the um, social compatibility issue. We know that monkeys are going to have conflict. This is natural. It will occur and it will occur repeatedly. Aggression, even in some cases, aggression with wounding does not necessarily mean the animals should be separated, but uh, they have this ability to reconcile and to maintain these long-term bonds. So I think we need more attention on this issue. We should avoid nursery rearing when it is not required for research or for clinical care. And infants should remain with dams until they become behaviorally independent. Next. On to environmental enrichment, where there've also been a large number of publications. Uh, through studying lots of different types of enrichment, we see that we can increase coping in our animals by promoting a variety of species typical behaviors. There's been recently some use of technology, computer tablets, communication systems, and these are being evaluated. And I do think there's tremendous potential there to improve welfare by offering challenging situations for animals, um, problem solving situations, et cetera. In practice, since the guide was last revised, there has been great advancement in the amount of enrichment that's being provided, the diversity of types of enrichment, and how often it's given. And as far as I know, enrichment is provided in all types of studies. Next. So my suggestion for the next version of the guide is that we encourage using enrichment methods that stimulate problem solving, uh, learning, and choice. Next, non-human primate training, and I'm referring to training the animals here. I'll be talking mostly about positive reinforcement training or PRT. Our literature recently has confirmed the feasibility of gaining cooperation with a wide variety of behaviors that are needed for animals held in research facilities. And there's a huge scope of procedures that have been accomplished with either entirely positive reinforcement methods or mostly positive reinforcement methods. And I've listed some of those here. Next. But in addition to just being able to train animals to do certain things, there are, there's a lot of other value in PRT. It can be used to treat abnormal behavior, desensitization methods, reduce fear, the field of applied behavior analysis is now uh, getting involved here. We're using these techniques to treat specific behavioral problems with great success. PRT can have positive impacts on welfare, uh, measured by physiological um, measures, looking at stress, and it provides this positive kind of interesting interaction with humans that are around uh, these animals. PRT can increase the efficiency of husbandry and research procedures, being able to do things faster, and it may improve the ease of conducting biomedical science and the quality of the science. So if animals are cooperating with daily injections, this makes it easier to complete the work. If, as in one lab, PRT was able to vastly reduce the amount of restraint that was being um, required by the studies, this, the researchers believe, will improve the validity of that work. And they have shown that it has reduced um, stress as a confound in their studies. Next. So I would suggest that we consider requiring preparation of non-human primates with PRT and desensitization for those who are on studies that are going to be involved in prolonged or frequent restraint. 
and that that this training go on until they have adapted and i've offered here uh, a definition of that adaptation consider preparing non-human primates using prt and desensitization on studies with experimental procedures that are going to involve some discomfort Behavioral experts should be evaluating training plans for research procedures in the IACUC review uh, process. And I want to say that I think there is tremendous potential here to improve animal welfare through these methods. Uh, it will also require additional human resources. We need expert animal trainers and increased staffing among all groups who will conduct procedures with non-human primates. Next non-human primate housing, and I'll spend more time on this issue because it is of great interest right now. This was described in a um, uh, talk yesterday and also was determined by a survey that I have uh, mentioned here. There's consensus that empirical information should guide these changes. And um, there's a, a lot of interest. I know I'm a part of a small group that's starting a consortium on this topic so we can work together. Recent research on cages and enclosure size have shown when we have very large increases, stereotyped behaviors can be eliminated or at least reduced. This is uh, true across several species. Doubling the vertical space had that kind of impact. Doubling standard cage did buffer the development of abnormal behaviors over time in a study and reduced the expression of some abnormal behaviors. Animals have preferences for areas that are high in their enclosures, no surprise. And one investigator concluded that the least amount of abnormal behavior is associated with the largest, most complex and enriched housing that they studied. Next. We know that the guides suggest periodic release of non-human primates into larger enclosures like this play cage shown here. A couple of studies have indicated Benefits of this kind of approach, um, increases in activity and reductions in some abnormal behaviors. So it looks like this is something that should be further emphasized. Some types of housing, particularly with solid floors, provide a substrate, the opportunity to use a substrate and foraging activities that go along with that. Studies have shown this is very beneficial to the animals but this type of procedure is really constrained by housing for so many of our primates. And in the, the um, survey that I mentioned, experts reported that the most important housing enh enhancements they would like to see for non-human primates were giving the animals the ability to climb, swing, jump, and retreat vertically. They also mentioned the use of verandas, visual barriers, and thermoneutral resting spaces as being quite important. Next. We've studied cage configuration, whether monkeys are living on the bottom or top tier, and there is more abnormal behavior among those living on the bottom tier of caging. Modern housing, sort of two-story living, does avoid this restriction to a bottom tier. Outdoor housing reduces abnormal behavior, very strong findings here. The use of porches and verandas and tunnels has gotten much more popular, hasn't been well studied yet, but um, is very well received. So I think that's something to be considered. As are situations like shown in this photo, where there is more conventional caging on the left side linked directly to larger spaces. Here you see the monkey through that window uh, who has access to this outdoor run. Next. So I believe there are deficits in studies that have been published on non-human primate housing. Most have modest sample sizes. There are a variety of confounding factors at play that haven't been experimentally controlled yet. There are some conflicting findings, and most of the studies don't include some of the measures we'd like to see, measures of animal health, their effective state, maybe physiological measures of stress. So I, in my opinion, the definitive studies have not yet been published, and we really need these. Next. This is an example of performance standards that one facility developed 
as they were designing new housing. And I think this is a great example of what we want our new housing to be able to support. The animals should be able to interact with conspecifics. They should be able to hide from one another, um, forage for food and get physical exercise. So I think this is an important document. Next. These are some topics that I believe we could learn more about with our existing housing. Um, and this would all be informative for an, the next version of the guide. We could compare standard caging in different configurations. When facilities have types of novel housing, they could evaluate that. And there are, th this is going on all over the country. A direct comparison of EU style housing with standard US housing, I think would be very important to complete. We could look at the duration of time animals might spend in smaller caging um, so that we could limit it so behavioral problems are not developing. Again, rotation through spaces. How long do they need to be in these spaces? How often? And evaluating design features like the substrate, the porches, and extensions on caging. Next. So considerations for the guide here. Existing research does not support a numeric or engineering type standing uh, standard for housing requirements. Instead, I think we need to be working toward functionally appropriate non-human primate environments. And these likely will require more space, more vertical space and rotation through larger spaces. We should encourage outdoor housing to reduce behavioral problems and encourage enclosures with floors that allow substrate and foraging opportunities. Next, I want to talk about behavioral assessment now, observation of behaviors um, to identify problems. This is being widely performed now, much more so than when the guide was last revised. Uh, although they vary across facilities in terms of how often these observations are done, the training that people have received and the complexity of their systems. Behavioral records are now sometimes communicated as non-human primates transfer between facilities. And some places are using behavioral profiles as screening tools for study assignment. I think our community is moving toward more comprehensive tools to measure welfare, those that include behavior, health, features of the environment, research procedures, and the animal's affect. Next. As we are developing these more comprehensive systems, the issue of accumulated lifetime experience is with us. Non-human primates live a long time, so they have that capacity to experience many negative things as well as many positive things. And we don't yet know if these have sustained impacts on welfare. And this is the crux of the, um, the construct of cumulative experience. There are some related constructs and approaches quality of life, um, allostatic load, using biomeasures to assess stress burden over an animal's lifetime. So I don't think there's consensus yet on the value of these various systems or even whether cumulative experience occurs. But if it does, uh, we wonder if it would compromise the value of our animals as research models. This could be really important in research reuse decisions and humane endpoints. So there are a modest number of papers here, but their value is, I think, very high. Next. So um, what could be considered in the guide here? Processes for behavioral assessment, monitoring schedules, how, treat, how treatment is done for behavioral problems, how it's evaluated. I believe that should be a requirement. Social housing and behavioral information being shared as animals transfer between facilities and something about these comprehensive long-term assessments of welfare over individuals' lifetimes. Next. Now there are many more experts in behavior in our programs. You can see here in larger programs with over 100 animals, um, many directors of, of behavioral management held PhDs or master's degrees. The American Society of Primatology suggests titles and roles for these experts, a scientific title, and then a, a daily implementation type of title. And the ASP also describes the need for experts to serve on IACUCs. Next. 
behavioral specialists should be incorporated somehow into the IACUC process, I believe. And those specialists could be referenced throughout the guide uh, where they are not um, in the past. Next. So I'll end here just saying I think this field has grown tremendously since the guide was last revised and incorporating that into the new version of the guide I, will significantly enhance welfare of the animals and I believe can improve the quality of our biomedical research. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now we'll hear from Dr. Vassbinder. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to talk about our institutional approach to uh, using behavioral performance standards for establishing a global program at GSK. Next slide. Um, this is a slide just acknowledging our three commitment to three R's and then our, our animal welfare statements. Next slide. Okay, so in 2005, we had uh, several sites, including the US, UK, EU, uh, China, and um, there were differences in housing strategies for all the animals, um, specifically dogs and monkeys were uh, called attention to with concern that there wasn't um, a, a sense of well-being for all the animals at different sites and that there needed to be some attention to how we were housing animals. And so the initial effort went to uh, establishing uh, housing paradigms that were consistent. And we wanted to base these on performance standards. Um, in, this, in this picture, you can see, I've been asked to speak about our dog housing, and I know more about that because I led that team. But uh, Lavon Meunier was my partner in crime. And um, these are the cages that were developed for our non-human primates, which have a central connecting area for uh, vertical space. And a bumped out uh, veranda where you'll find the animal, many of the times you'll find the animals there. That's where they like to hang out and watch everybody else in the room. So we created a team. It, um, it was a team of people across our global programs to consider housing for dogs. And um, we, and if you own dogs, you'll, you'll relate to these comments um, that we set priorities for our housing. Um, and we tried to keep it somewhat simple, but um, the priority was that we wanted social housing because dogs are social. We wanted to encourage good visibility for the animals. Um, there's plenty of pictures with dogs on top of dog houses and on hills. I think that um, the pack dogs uh, spend a lot of time monitoring the environment. Uh, we wanted an, an appropriate size. And so the, the this was a little, probably the stickiest part of this project because there's a lot of differences in dog housing paradigms. We had dogs in one over one stack caging. We had dogs in runs. We had dogs in the UK that were under the requirements of the UK law that had fairly sizable um, uh, runs. And then uh, the EU directive has its own advice for the size. So we uh, convened a group of behaviorists to confirm, uh, and they were from both the US and the UK, to confirm what would be deemed as an appropriate size for a cage. And the, the performance standard that we came up with was that the animal was able to change gait within the cage. Um, we also prioritized soft sleeping surfaces and uh, social contact with humans, which is very important. Okay, next slide. So the pictures that you see are pictures of our dog housing that we created. They are on, um, they are, first of all, the. so I'll start with the door. If you look on the door, there's uh, horizontal bars. Horizontal bars really advocate best visibility because the vertical bars actually create a visual block for the animals. Um, also, you can see that the end panel is a plexiglass panel rather than stainless steel, which allows the dogs to see through the, the um, caging. Next slide. Uh, here you see dogs uh, in, so there is a bumped out section of the cage and the animals spend a lot of time in that bumped out section because they could actually see all the way down the hallway in the room. And, um, and you can also see that we group house dogs Usually, you know, about, you know, between three and five dogs. If you get more than that, there can be skirmishes. Um, and so it's a little easier to manage if you have groups of about five. Next slide. 
Uh, this, these are pictures within the cage. Um, so in the back of the cage was a, a raised uh, surface for lying and the blue is a bed. Some of the beds we put uh, soft surfaces on like a fleece. Uh, others of the dogs used these as chew toys um, and did not take advantage of the, um, of the soft surface. And then you can see the ability to see through those cages and down between the animals within their cages. Next slide. Um, one of my favorite aspects of this caging is the, the ability to have improved social interaction with humans. Um, this is what I call a Dutch door or a half door. Um, and it allows us to interact with the animals without having to ha open the door and have all the animals come out. Um, it allows to uh, give medicines in the time that you don't want, you just want to uh, single out one animal. And it's a great way for uh, just a short-term interaction with the dogs. Okay, next slide. This is an, a picture of our um, EU, EU housing for dogs. Um, it's not that different. A major difference between Europe and the U.S. is that the um, dog uh, floor substrate is required to be solid. And that was uh, decided in a, a workshop that occurred in Germany in um, the late 1990s, uh, early 2000s, where the, it was agreed that they would use solid housing for the dogs. The reason we used raised housing is because of the weight of some of the panels. It allowed us to spray down the um, the, the kennels when the dogs were out of them and to clean them without having to move the dogs uh, to not, not we'd move the dogs, but it, it was really for the ease of cleaning and this um, style of the room that we had with the drains. These dogs will, when they clean these dogs, they'll use a broom and a dustpan and uh, then they're mopped out. And um, so you can see some similarities that there's the horizontal bars. You have to be careful with horizontal bars. Some dogs can climb them. Um, but, uh, and then in the back, that's their bed. And we had a camera system set up and confirmed that the dogs all sleep in that bed. Okay, next slide. So the other thing that had to be addressed was the opportunity for exercise. And it was agreed by our group that dogs needed 20 to 30 minutes a day for exercise. And one of the things that really struck me was once I was visiting a facility where there were dogs that were uh, allowed to exercise in a room that was about 10 by 10. And it really, it did give them a break from the pen that they were in, but it didn't allow them to uh, um, exhibit behaviors that would be normal for a dog. All the people on this team had their own dogs. And so, you know, we had our own observations of what happens when a dog exercises. And you all probably have the same observations that, you know, you let your dog out, they run for about, you know, 10 or 15 minutes for young dogs and maybe don't run at all if they're older dogs. And um, then they settle down and start exploring. And so, you know, trying to provide space that was like that for the animals. Um, it was desirable to have them exercising in groups and it was required that staff were with them at all times. We did do some observations where staff weren't present and we found that the dogs moved a lot more when staff were present and were more interactive and uh, active. Um, if you left the older dogs in for long periods of time, they would just lay down and sleep in that space. Um, so uh, one other thing that we did find useful was providing toys and, and things for dogs to interact with. And we all know that that's something that benefits a dog. Okay, next slide. So this was our room that we were able to uh, create for exercise. They got exercise once a day, 20 to 30 minutes. It was 28 feet by 16 feet, and we wanted to provide some complexity for the animals. Next slide. Um, this is, these are pictures of dogs interacting in that space, doing what they do. Um, and you can see that they do interact with the, the, um, with the structures that are put in there. Um, next slide. And they do use and carry around the um, toys that are in there. And you can tell that this dog is responding to the person who's taking a picture. So they are very interactive with the staff. And, you know, the staff would sit on the floor and work with them. So next slide. So what I think is really important about this uh, approach to the uh, housing of our primates and, and dogs is that it allowed us to 
recognize the need that the behavioral needs of the animals. And so we formed a group in 2015 called the Animal Welfare Community of Practice. It's a global group. So having members from all of our sites and, and especially people that are interested in this kind of thing to share recommended practices, things they found that worked and things that didn't and maintain uh, our a connection across our GSK systems. Um, we uh, have a science-based approach to our animal welfare initiatives. And what we were asked to do is to create behavioral performance standards to help assess the animal welfare and look at how we can manage our behavior programs. And um, the team was made up of people who were really interested in this topic. Next, next slide. So the objectives of the behavioral performance standards were to identify the most important behaviors that we wanted to encourage and to identify behaviors we wanted to discourage. And we did this by doing extensive literature reviews um, and in, not just in animals housed in research environments, but also the basic behaviors and natural behaviors of animals in the wild, as well as uh, if companion animals were uh, appropriate. And for dogs, that was true. And this information was used to enhance our programs for enrichment. Next slide. So uh, we called on the, we used the Disney Animal Enrichment website, which is very useful that Disney uses this for their, uh, for all species of their animals that they house. And they go through the process of what's called SPIDER. It is setting goals, planning, implementing goals, and then documenting it and reevaluating it. So documenting it would be, you know, taking behavioral um, measurements and looking at how useful the aspects they wanted to emphasize in the, the uh, environment were, and then reevaluate. So it's a constant process of reevaluating. Okay, next slide. Uh, so what we did was we used um, the information we had gathered on natural behaviors, species appropriate behavior, and what we had collected from experts. And, you know, some of it was um, knowledge experts, not just data. And we completed the resource tool on the Disney website that's called a goal setting document, which does help us highlight the things that we value for those animals in their environment. And we started with mice, rats, rabbits, mini pigs, macaques, and dogs. And we wrote these um, as must or should be able to or will or may benefit with regard to the behaviors. Next slide. And we also used the paradigm that is um, to evaluate our different um, aspects of the program to answer the questions of what, why, and how. So an example of that's on the next slide. So an example would be mouse nesting. You know, we've spoken about this already. Uh, what, uh, so the, the question is how valuable is mouse? We wanted to emphasize mouse nesting or the ability for a mouse to build a nest. So what is the activity? It's building a nest, an appropriate nest. Why to create a place for them to um, stay warm and secure. It, uh, it had to allow for all the animals to um, be invo um, involved in the nest. And um, it addressed the highly motivating behavior of mouse of nest building for mice. And then how did we do this? We used um, different tissues and uh, nest slip materials and uh, considered uh, the aspects of how mice like to build nests with various um, coarseness of structure and, um, and, and, and different materials for their nest building. Next slide. So our dog, behavior, dog behavioral performance standards added to what we already had included in our caging, which, in what, which was that dogs should be housed in compatible groups. Um, they should have regular human contact. They should be able to exercise and play. They should be able to hide and get away from uh, other animals, which is really an important aspect to the um, caging paradigm. They should be able to exhibit coping behaviors. They should be able to engage in mentally and sensory stimulating activities. I, I, um, I know there are programs that use, be, you know, if you look at what motivates a dog, I know there are programs that use smelling um, opportunities for dogs. We used um, uh, 
bedding in a little kid swimming pool and then hid treats in it. And it was always the same dog that was really motivated to find those treats that was digging through that bedding. But, you know, it was an activity that kept them motive, um, interested and stimulated. Sorry, sidetrack. Dogs should be able to lie or rest on soft material. Dogs should be able to gnaw or chew and they should be have the potentially have the opportunity to eliminate in a designated area. And we see this, it's an important thing to consider. We see this in our rabbit um, enrichment program. Well, they're, they'll hold their urine until they get to their exercise space and then they'll urinate and defecate in that space. And then when people check the animals for urine and feces, there's nothing in their cage. And it's like, ah, that, that one likes to urinate in a different space. Okay, so um, next slide. Uh, so with that, I, I'll finish my presentation. I wanted to acknowledge uh, LaVon Meunier and her uh, important work that she's done for the program. She really was the driver for a lot of these efforts. Doctors Margaret Landy and Patrick Weir for their uh, leadership and resource management of what was a fairly costly experience, but worth it. And the hiring of Erica Watson, who is just a wonderful behaviorist and two individuals that manage our behavioral uh, programs for GSK. And lastly, the leadership of Yoletta Sola Soto and um, her leadership and progression of the animal welfare community of practice. And with that, I'm done. Thank you so much. Now we'll hear from Dr. Malbrew. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Ralph Malbrew, the Director and Attending Veterinarian at the University of Virginia. Um, and I've been tasked with talking a little bit on some suggestions and considerations for aquatics, uh, specifically non-zebrafish, uh, which can you imagine is a, is a huge task and, and something I probably won't be able to cover all in, in these 18 minutes, but um, hopefully to at least spark some conversation and some things to consider. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I, I think the biggest thing in the theme that you'll hear me kind of echo throughout uh, about my presentation is there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot of aquatic species. And I think the diversity and the uniqueness is something that um, is very interesting, but also needs to be celebrated and keep and kept in mind as we come up with uh, recommendations, uh, new regulations, and so forth. Um, and it's across all right, across the globe. And so not all, not all these species uh, could be fit into a box. And I think uh, we have to be very careful. Uh, we make these considerations of comparing them to other commonly used uh, laboratory animals such as such as mice and rodents, which I think we all know historically we, we, we maybe have done that. It has put um, several institutions, researchers, uh, you name it, um, kind of in, in difficult spots to be able to follow through on some of these recommendations. So I, I think this is just a few examples of things that we uh, have had here at UVA, prior places that I've worked. And I think you can see that every one of these requires some different uh, life support system, uh, some different water quality, different feeding, um, a different housing setup. And so all of that has to be taken into consideration as we try our best to make very broad, right, uh, as much as we can useful uh, recommendations and considerations and, and some of these updates. So uh, again, that'll be the theme here is uh, I can't emphasize that enough. And I think a lot of folks and colleagues who work uh, with aquatic species beyond the zebrafish, uh, we'll, we'll share the same sentiment. Next slide, please. So again, um, here is just a few of the things that uh, we have here as UVA, just to kind of have a uh, just a small example of, of what of the diversity can, can take place. But I think another thing to keep in mind is, uh, so we're, we're kind of unique as well, and several other institutions have field stations. Um, and some of these are on the coast. And um, I think a lot of times people think about birds, uh, you think about reptiles, uh, but fish are also in other aquatic species, some semi-aquatic species typically are caught at these. So I think also not forgetting about uh, fill stations and our role in that and, and recommendations as it pertains to, are they coming back to the institution? Are they gonna be just at that fill station kind of off main campus? Um, and, and, and what are the thoughts there, I think is also really important. So just one thing to highlight. Next slide, please. Now, um, I had the pleasure of being a part of uh, some survey um, uh, kind of task force through ZHA, which is the Zebrafish Husbandry Association this past year. 
uh, which was really targeted looking at more the uh, aquatic technicians role, uh, what type of species are they working with? Obviously, zebrafish was kind of at the forefront, but we were really interested and wanted to use this opportunity to kind of get an understanding of across the globe, since this international organization, what are people working with? What is the educational background? Uh, but again, it, it was it was kind of designed to help us get some insight on systems um, to be able to 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 come up with some recommendations and at least start that conversation and report out. So. Um, I wanted to share some of this with this group because we thought it might be helpful. So next slide, please. And as you can imagine, you know, when you think about non-zebrafish, what are those other aquatics that folks are working with their institutions? Obviously, Xenopus, uh, Tropicalis, and Labus are, are kind of second, second in command. But then this aquatic inverts, right, which uh, when we think about cephalopods, a lot of conversation going on now. And, and, and I would assume that in this upcoming uh, uh, updates that cephalopod. So, you know, that's we're talking about squids, octopus, cuttlefish, and so forth that are 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 commonly becoming more common at institutions. Uh, there will be some language and, and it would be it would be behoove us to include some language and recommendations to include those species there because a lot of folks are working with them. Though they're not covered obviously now in that context, uh, everywhere in every other country outside of uh you know the US, they they are in, in the sense of all inverts. Uh, but I think specifically for cephalopods, we know this is coming. So something to, to, to also keep keep in mind at the forefront. And then uh, thereafter, that is just a, a just a host of other different types of species from cichlids, axolotls. Um, we even got some responses uh, for 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 the friends down in the southeast of the U.S. that are working with alligators that have been used in studies for um, for euthanasia studies. So it does run the gambit. And again, I think just showing this breadth of the species that people reported back with. Again, it, it can't emphasize it again enough that we have to be careful to not uh, put things in a box to where it's just one size fits all when it comes to, especially the husbandry and housing. Next slide, please. So uh, as we all know, there's an RFI that was put out probably cl close to six months or so ago now from NIH asking for information on some proposed guidelines for cephalopods. So uh, again, want to use this opportunity to, I know there's still opportunity, I believe, to, to send in some suggestions, uh, but there's a lot of articles out there. It's something that's coming. I think all institutions should be preparing for this. Um, and I think we have a, a very unique and uh, you know, position here um, in our in our field to be able to uh, take the rims of those um, and, and give some really good uh, points and gui guiding points again of the can't put everything in the box. We're still learning quite a bit of uh, what are the best housing mechanisms, what are the best analgesics. So just to be very careful in the language that we use. Um, and again, cephalopods are probably at the top of that uh, top of that point right now. What's to come of new of new? Next slide, please. Um, OLA, I, one thing I want to do with this is also provide just a lot of great resources for those who will be writing um, and, and involved in the uh, the format of putting up uh, the updates of the new guide. So obviously OLA has a great resource on the cephalopods with, with tons of, of, uh, of papers and manuscripts that are out there across the globe. Um, so I would highly, highly uh, advocate to, to check that out. Next slide, please. And I think the biggest thing uh, that I know a lot of us are always big advocates are is collaborative, uh, the collaborative nature. And uh, that's one thing I really appreciate about Lab Animal, but I don't think we have to go too far to specifically for we're talking about aquatic uh, inverse cephalopods more specifically. Felisa did a great job, our friends in the, in the EU, about almost 15 years ago now, ahead of the game of putting together some guidelines, come up this consensus of it's a 90 page document that go dives deep into housing, husbandry, feeding and, and so forth. So this is probably one of those um, manuscripts that I would star um, these kind of guidelines that I think would be extremely helpful um, with the updates. Next slide, please. Um, and the same goes along. I kind of mentioned again that Xenopis was kind of number two in there. Right, and there's a, a paper more recently came out a couple of years ago on uh, just general housing care from the National Xenopus Resource that I think is extremely helpful and people should keep in their back pocket. And then when it comes to axolotls, while again, maybe they're not everywhere, but when they are at institutions, they usually are in pretty large numbers, um, which can bring uh, some challenges. Next slide, please. 
Um, one other thing to just make aware for the group, and I know a lot of you are, are probably aware of this, something that's in the motions that I think when it comes to aquatics and being able to, um, you know, a, as fluid as it is, as we find, it's almost like every week some new paper comes out about uh, best feeding practices for a lot of these different species, or if it's best housing or best water quality techniques or uh, so forth. I think continue to have platforms where we can share information uh, publicly uh, in a safe manner uh, is, is, is going to be the key. And so um, obviously this federal demonstration partnership is something that is uh, on the on the cusp of, of hopefully being released soon. That'll, I think when it comes to aquatic species and a lot of these kind of non uh, unique, um, non rodent species is going to be extremely helpful for institutions to safely share uh, policies, SOPs, and so forth, and, and definitely IACUCs. So it's something to keep on the horizon as well. Next slide, please. Um, and, and then I think uh, the biggest thing to keep in mind as well is how are these animals housed? So uh, in that survey, um, you know, we found that, you know, there has been a shift right over time over the many years we've been using aquatic species. Uh, we talk about zebra fish a lot, but there's there's so 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 many others. Um, and the top of that is, is a RAS system, right? So re recirculating aquatic system, which we refer to as the life support system, uh, seems to be the, the majority. Uh, but I think we also ask a lot of questions about the management practices. So who provides the care when we talk about the training for these animals? Is it the lab, which at a lot of institutions is the case? It's, it's not the lab animal core, so to speak. Um, or is it a shared kind of management where it's kind of both um, and who, who's paying for that? So I think um, some guidance on I think I think we've realized that obviously PI managed labs can can work well, but I think there's a huge shift where you're seeing laboratory animals the core uh, groups take over that, that the, the daily practice is similar to, to a lot of our commonly used species as mice, not human primates. And I think we see the level of, uh, of, of, of welfare and the, the, the increase of publications and research advancements of science that happens where researchers can kind of take a step back, uh, get their hands out of the rotifer bucket, as we joke and say, and really focus on the hard science. Um, so I think from from that standpoint, just some guide or some recommendations, suggestions on uh, who's managing these facilities. Uh, I'm not saying it, it has to be the lab animal group, but I think um, just some considerations for uh, recommendations on on that end, and then uh, best practices for housing housing systems. And there's there's a variety out there, uh, and, and they all work all work well. And I think kind of taking a step back and looking at performance standards, and I'll talk a little bit about talk a little bit about that in the coming coming slides. So next slide, please. So again, the one size fits all. Um, it, it's, it's as nice as it would be for aquatic species, um, as nice it would be to just buy a mouse rack and flip into a recirculating system, it's just not the case. Um, so I think, again, I, I can't emphasize that enough that there is no one size fits all uh, for, for our fishy friends. Next slide, please. And this is often kind of how I think um, PIs, the researchers, um, maybe even sometimes the vets, <laughs> it's a veterinarian feel when you work with these species that is just so limited information, uh, but there's a lot coming out. And so I think, again, emphasizing using performance standards as the institutions and trusting in our IACUCs um, of those policies, those SOPs that are developed, you know, scientifically backed by some kind of internal study that shows that whatever their housing, husbandry, feeding practices are efficient, uh, they keep those animals happy, they're breeding well, they're taken care of, and we have outstanding animal welfare, I think is, is really the, the, the way to go be, because things are so new, because they are so fluent, and because we are still learning so much about these, uh, these animals. Next slide, please. Um, so current language uh, can be found when, specifically when we talk about housing and husbandry here, uh, pages 77 to 88. Next slide, please. Um, and through that, again, so some of the suggestions, and th this is coming from a collective group of folks that I, that I got a chance to speak with on this, but again, continue to highlight and highlight and support development of, of housing husbandry practices based on performance and experience standards uh, at the institutional level in working with those trusted IACOs or, or equivalent um, in the respective countries, right? And I think the important thing is the, the routinely being evaluated, you know, those SOPs, those procedures uh, for the housing, the husbandry, um, sentinel programs and so forth, right? I think that's the safe, the key word there is that, you know, even at the institutional level, but it should be routinely evaluated as these new publications are coming out, right? As we're having these workshops and finding out these new uh, best ways to house these animals. Right, and it runs down runs down the list for all these, and and obviously I think the biggest 
uh, some of the biggest topics where there's a lot of conversation, right? And we've seen is densities, um, enrichment, and so forth. Um, and then obviously the continuation of using the correct language, uh, I think, which also uh, is a is a huge beneficiary. So saying life support system, for example, is 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 great, right? That encompasses the static tank, it encompasses the recirculating system. Um, so um, and, and which is, you know, really a lot of times one of the most critical points in aquatic facilities is the life support system itself and the water quality. Yeah, you take care of the water quality, then a lot of the rest of it takes care of itself when it pertains to animal welfare and the health of those, uh, whatever critters is living in that water. Next slide, please. So he, here's a, a primary example. I know many of us have dealt with this, especially if you work with zebrafish or you've worked with uh, xenopus in your facilities. Uh, page 83, when we talk about space and densities, and I think you know, we said generally house five adult fish per liter. Um, and, I, and I can't think of an institution at this point in time who who has five fish per liter. I mean, most are up to 12 to 15 fish per liter. And this fish do perfectly fine. I mean, even with even with frogs, depending on the size. So, again, being able to uh, really vet and allow institutions to have those performance standards, uh, that data internally, that's 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 backed by that by those studies internally and reviewed by uh, some similar IACA group. Um, I think it's really important, and I think that's that has shown to be successful now that a lot of institutions have moved on beyond uh, what is has been one of the suggestions in the current uh, guide. So I think that's a key thing to really review, look at is those numbers and, and not trying to be as specific, but more so, again, specific to the, those performance standards for that particular species, because it does vary uh, so much. And I think, uh, you know, shout out to Chris Lawrence. He was ahead of his time when he and that the sentence in, in the red of this guidance is not necessarily relevant for other species of fish and may change its research advances. So uh, I think he knew what was to come. And, and I think that that sentence itself has saved a lot of institutions being able to do those performance standards to go beyond house more animals, which, um, you know, for social so showing species such as some of these are, is, is actually really good. And having fewer can actually lead to things such as aggression in tanks and so forth. So uh, I think it's really important, again, uh, to trust in the institutions, uh, the experience, um, and these performance standards as we continue to evolve and develop and learn more about these, these animals. Next slide, please. Um, and, and another thing we talk about, uh, I won't go too, too much just for the sake of time when it comes to uh, life stages and counting animals. So it's very, very high level, but uh, there's been an idea that's been thrown out when it comes to census of looking at biomass. Um, for uh, particularly large populations of aquatic species, whether that be fish, frogs, whatever, uh, you know, you, you're, you're housing at your institution. But that biomass is something that's been used for, for years in the aquaculture sector, which is very, very efficient uh, for being able to track that population on that life support system. Um, and I think it's a way of still achieving the goal of what the guy um, is, is meaning to do, right? Honoring that humane treatment in the three R's, right? You're, you're still able to do that by understanding the biomass. Um, and, and I use the example of uh, the FDA has approved, um, there's several uh, medications out there that can be used uh, where you write a VFD, a veterinary feed directive to treat for different outbreaks, um, say in our pathogens in a, in a aquatic population. And one of the things they ask for is, is biomass. So this is that, that number, that percentage is something that has been heavily vetted as a as a figure that is very uh, beneficial and critical uh, and key to being able to identify the number of animals in a life support system or a population to effectively treat them. So, so it must be good for something when you're trying to talk about the overall health of these animals um, because it can be extremely difficult uh, being fully transparent as pertains to uh, taking a census uh, when it comes to uh, large aquatic heavy where there's heavy breeding. Um, um, egg laying, polycultures, you name it, in, in a system. So just something that has been in, in some conversations that I think should uh, be potentially be mentioned as some mechanisms of acceptable means of, of, of understanding the population of your, of your aquatic species in that system. And uh, I linked a couple of papers here. There's some really, really cool uh, kind of non-invasive ways where you don't have to take fish out and measure them or get weights using illumination um, and video uh, that are relatively inexpensive and used at large scale at, at aquaculture uh, centers 
uh, to be able to, to, to get a count or right, to get that biomass. And it's very similar to, to the programs that have these RFID systems for your rodents, right? Large sensors, heavy breeding, you can get accurate numbers. So I think it's something that we should be considering um, as we move on in, in, in the future. Next slide, please. Um, and a shameless plug here for some more data that we're we're trying to collect with the survey. So uh, that I, some of this data that I presented here. So if you do have aquatic species, uh, feel free. We're still collecting a lot of data on that. We share. It's going to be developed into a white paper uh, through ZHA. All right. Next slide, please. And because there's so many aquatic species out there, I, I think I listed over 80 plus references that might help this uh, could might help this committee and the working group put together for it specifically non zebrafish aquatic species, and, and a lot of them are the cephalopods, which I know is to come. So hopefully this is helpful and continues the conversation uh, of, of how to how to continue to, to advocate for these animals and make sure they're included and we do things the right way. Next slide, please. I believe that is it. There's my contact if there's any questions or comments. And, uh, thank you for the time and uh, for, for all the work in organizing this. It's been fantastic. All right, that was, uh, thank you uh, for the speakers this morning and very enlightening information. So uh, we have three questions from the uh, participants uh, this morning. And uh, let me, if I may, read them and then we can ask the individual speakers, depending on the question, who is the most appropriate to answer the given question. So. Do you think that low stress care, good enrichment, including nesting and housing minimum can make up for the basic noises? Thermal people vibration are adapted to less stressed. And uh, that would be our colleague from Novartis, Dr. Caskill. Do you want to answer that question, please? Sure. And I'm probably going to answer that question with, it depends. Um, in, in some of the examples they gave, you know, nesting helps eliminate thermal stress. It provides a darker environment. It, it provides um, an opportunity for thigmotaxis to feel enclosed. So I think it really depends on what those stressors are and how that allows them to control them. And so I think in many ways, nesting material, like I said, for, for, for mice in particular, and maybe for reproductive animals, is probably a necessity and not necessarily something that we say is enriching their environment, but helping them, helping them to adapt to the uh, conditions we're housing them in. But ultimately, I think it comes down to how much control are we giving them over what these stressors are. And that's when um, kind of talking about human interaction, providing um, habituation, acclimation, training can be so, so substantial um, in reducing those stressors and allowing them to predict what's going to happen and reducing that stress. So um, I think it depends in what those stressors are and what we're providing them with opportunities to control them. So yes, and maybe. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I could also ask that similar question for the primate user in terms of noise, stress, vibration, obviously can become quite noisy in a uh, non-human primate setting. So, um, Dr. Bloomsmith, did you have comments on uh, the question, not necessarily nesting in materials, but others that can minimize stress in that environment? Well, you mentioned noise and, and vibration, and there's been little to no research on how those external factors might affect the welfare of non-human primates, although many working with them feel like noise in particular could be, um, could be a stressor. And uh, some of the noise that they might be exposed to having to do with say, cleaning procedures and other standardized procedures that are going on 
there, there is a little bit of thought that um, signaling to animals might be a, a useful way of signaling when, for example, your room is about to be clean versus those around you, when the animals may be a little disturbed hearing that the cleaning is, is about to happen, but signaling so that they would, you know, essentially know now's our turn. Um, so there, there are some interesting thoughts out there, but I think we're pretty far from knowing how those particular variables would affect non-human primate welfare. Thank you. So uh, the next question is, it's known that temperature differences uh, between actual room temperature and the well-nested microenvironment for mice, or is the microenvironment temperature just too variable to identify an actual direct relationship? Again, Dr. Caskell. Actually, we've published on that showing that um, they can substantially, if you give them enough time and enough insulation. So my comments around appropriate nesting material and amount of nesting material, it really comes down to the insulation uh, factors, some basic physics um, that this comes down to. But we've documented um, up to 12 degrees Celsius, uh, probably close to 32 can be they can get up to inside those nests if they have enough time, enough insulation. Um, they can be quite uh, substantially warmer than the uh, exterior environment. And the thing that's lovely about this solution is the animals build to what they need. If they feel like they need more insulation, they'll make a more enclosed nest. And if they don't need as much, let's say we increase the temperatures, their nests naturally open up so that they can um, they they don't hold on to as much of that heat. So that's really the beauty there is the animals control what they need. And uh, how's the PI community uh, responding to these behavioral adjustments? Dr. Caskell, in terms of nesting material and access to the mice? So I think actually I've felt more of a pushback from the laboratory animal science community based on regulations that say that they have to visualize the animals. Yeah. Um, and so if they build these really beautiful complex nests and we're in there during the day when they're normally resting, we can't see them because they're in these beautiful and right. nests. However, I've also done some additional work um, uh, that illustrates that if they're sick, um, they will be outside of the nest. Um, and so, or their nests open up as they, they don't engage in as much nesting behavior behavior if they're if they don't feel well so you're more likely to visualize them so there have been some efforts by the university of michigan to put together some um, recommendations posters around their vivarium that illustrate look at the nest as much as look at the animal to tell you how those animals are doing very good thank you so um this is from dr corngay uh asking a question of dr vastbinder and it's specifically, do you have experience or thoughts regarding caging housing for canine models or aged dogs that may have limited mobility and therefore could be susceptible to problems such as decubitus, ulcers, urine scalding, et cetera? So this is apropos to Dr. Corgay's uh, presentation yesterday. Right, um, so that's the beauty of performance standards, right? that it's built around the needs of the animals. And so what I would recommend that you would do is go back through the needs of those dogs. I mean, we highlighted, we work with young beagles in pharma, um, but you know, what are the needs of those dogs? Management of health care, so access to the animals would be hugely important. Um, giving them a soft surface if they have decubital ulcers, um, you know, uh, also, whatever human interaction is enriching to them, that would be another thing I'd highly uh, emphasize. So it would be up to your laboratory team to set a, make a set of priorities for those animals that would help define the housing as well as the behavioral management for them. Great. And so not to ignore you, Ralph. <laughs> uh, I have a question. <laughs> I have a question uh, related to environmental conditions in the other aquatic uh, systems that you deal with. Uh, is there research regarding temperature, noise, vibration? I would think some of those variables are very important 
in the context of experimental design, et cetera? A absolutely. There's uh, actually been quite a bit that's been uh, put out as it pertains to that in both the micro and macro environment um, for a var variety of species. More, more has been obviously the common ones, right? So the xenophis, uh, uh, some, some on axolotls, and then even in the, on the, the EU side in the cephalopods, there's actually quite a bit as it pertains to that of, of vibrations. Um, I'm trying to think of the study off mind where they actually were doing it based off construction that was going on. We often think about the mice um, and vibration and getting pads under those racks, but uh, and I could say zebra. I know wasn't talking about zebrafish, but prime example and uh, other aquatic species like zebrafish where they have been impacted by those uh, by those vibrations. So uh, we can't we can't forget about them or leave them out. And there is uh, in those links in that QR code, I put a couple of papers that uh, are linked to that to hopefully help. Uh, guys, some of the conversations when some of these updates go into uh, these conversations are happening for the updates. Very good. So, are there questions uh, that we we have one more? Huh? Well, actually, um, uh, Kim, please. Yeah. So this is Elaine, um, Dr. Malbrew. I was thinking about how many IACUXA organizations they struggle to have appropriate subject matter experts on these um, non-typical or diverse species. So I was wondering, are there any um, domestic or global organizations where some of these institutions could reach out for assistance or consultation? Um, uh, you know, obviously um, you've spoken about quite a few already, but I wasn't sure if that was something that had been uh, discussed at some of these conferences or meetings. Yeah, so um, I, I mean, obviously, Zerg, um, I, I just gave an example about uh, the uh, ZHA is great for zebra fish, but from a aquatic, all aquatics of WAVMA, the World Aquatic Veterinary Medical Association. Um, while it says veterinarian, there's actually a lot of PhDs, biologists that are involved in that, and they put quite a few webinars. And I, and I know of IACUCs that have consulted on a global level with that group where they find subject matter experts. Um, and then obviously in the states, um, you know, reaching out to your you know, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services, they always are, have been a great resource uh, to to connect, you know, uh, members or whoever's reviewing that protocol or or just coming in um, as an SME on the committee to provide uh, another set of eyes, which I think is important if I cooks to be honest with themselves and they get a protocol in with a species are not comfortable with it is important to just swallow that pride and reach out for help. But, uh, but that's another group to answer your question. Obviously, uh, ZHA. Um, I know a lot of aquatic technicians now that are looking at also AALSO, uh, which is more on the, the zoo side of things when it comes to understanding life support systems. And we found that that is actually a really good training opportunity for those type of technicians, but they have a, a breadth of knowledge of, of uh, not necessarily veterinarians or PhDs, but those animal caregivers and those roles that really understand the husbandry side, which I think would be a good a good group to look at uh, as well. Uh, oh, um, all right. Thank you very much for the speakers this morning.